In 1989, a female Marine captain disappeared from her quarters without a trace. Known for her exemplary conduct, her colleagues found it hard to believe that she'd gone able. Military authorities suspected she'd fallen victim to foul play. The FBI joined the investigation. They would find the decorated officer or bring her a second to justice. Shirley Russell was a determined woman, determined enough to reach the rank of captain in the United States Marine Corps. When this decorated officer turned up missing, her colleagues refused to believe she'd gone AWOL. It was unclear whether Captain Shirley Russell was dead or alive. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When a crime is committed on a military installation, it falls under federal jurisdiction. Agents would have to rely on their dedication and instinct to solve the mystery of her disappearance. The Marine Corps base at Quantico, Virginia is located 35 miles south of Washington, D.C. Since 1917, it has been headquarters to one of the nation's most selective branches of the military. Over 3,000 Marines train, work, and live on the 100 square mile base. Nearly everything in civilian life is mirrored on base, from department stores to housing. Married officers have the option of living on base in married officers' quarters, which are known as MOQ. For six months, MOQ number 394D was the home of Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell and her husband, Robert Russell. By January 1989, Captain Russell decided to end the marriage. For the next month, she would stay with a friend off base until bachelor's housing was available. Shirley packed her civilian clothes, her uniforms, and her Marine issue firearm. Robert begged her to stay, but Shirley was determined. For her, the move was final. For Robert, the separation meant he had to move off base. As a former Marine, he would be losing his last tie to the Corps. Captain Russell continued to advance in her career as the adjutant to the commanding officer of the support battalion at the Marine Basic School. She was in charge of all personnel matters and administrative needs of the support battalion. She was known as a dedicated Marine by her peers and by her commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel James Hodges. When I first met Shirley Russell, I was very impressed with the fact that she was a black female captain because we just don't have that many in the Marine Corps and that she had come from a poor background and was making something of herself, and she seemed so energized and so eager to, uh, to keep moving up the, uh, the, the rank uh, structure. Captain Russell? While assigned together, they built a friendship based on mutual respect. I can't talk to you right now. Now is not a good time. Hodges knew that Shirley's marriage was in trouble. My relationship with Shirley Russell was very special, in, even though that I was her commanding officer and her, her ultimate boss, if you will. I was very uh, close to her as sort of a, a big brother mentor. And she, we talked sometimes at, you know, after working hours about her situation, uh, her marriage, her past, and so forth. Thank you, sir. On Thursday, March 2nd, about a month after her split with Robert, Shirley requested leave from work. She needed to clean her former quarters and finalize her legal separation. 
Four days later, on Monday, March 6th, Hodges arrived at the office, expecting to find Shirley at her desk. He was surprised to find her office empty. Shirley had a perfect work record. She had never been late to report. And when I walked in the door, I asked uh, Major Buck Bourgeois right away, and I said, where's Shirley? And he said, sir, she's not here. And instantly, I felt like, oh no, something has happened to her. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges investigated the unauthorized absence. Captain Russell had recently moved into bachelor officer's quarters on base. Hodges hoped he would find her at home. Captain Russell. Captain Russell. We'll the door, Corporal, please, sir. As the missing captain's commanding officer, Hodges had authorization to search the room. Captain Russell. There was no sign of her, and no indication she had moved out. The Marines returned to the office and contacted the captain's husband, who now lived off base. Hodges knew that Robert Russell had helped Shirley clean and paint their vacated quarters over the weekend. They arranged to meet at the couple's former MOQ. Marine officers inspected the residence. Russell told them that he and Shirley had met here around noon on Saturday to do some touch-up painting. According to Russell, Shirley volunteered to buy some paint from the base exchange at about 1.30. He claimed that she didn't take her car, but walked to the PX instead. Russell said he hadn't seen her since. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges didn't believe Robert Russell's story. It hit me as just totally a lie because the PX was probably four or five miles away. And there's no way in the world that she would have walked to the PX from their quarters. Outside the quarters, the officers also inspected Russell's storage shed. On the floor, Colonel Hodges noticed a rust-colored stain. Russell dismissed it as paint. Hodges was skeptical. He was no expert, but to him, it looked like blood. Lieutenant Colonel Hodges briefed the Naval Investigative Service. The NIS reported the possibility of a crime to the FBI's Washington field office. The NIS briefed special agents on the case. Captain Russell had been missing for three days. With no indication of her whereabouts, the agents followed standard procedure. Special Agent Alan Malinchak headed the case. When you have somebody missing, you either have a, a case of an abduction, uh, you have a case of a, a missing person, somebody who's walked away uh, for whatever reason, or you uh, have foul play. So the initial investigation that the FBI was involved in ran all three of those uh, investigative lines. Mr. Russell? According to standard procedure, the missing woman's husband, Robert Russell, was the first to be questioned. Thank you very much. He told agents that he was talking with a neighbor around 1.30 the afternoon of Shirley's disappearance when a friend of hers stopped by to pick her up for lunch. At 3.30, Robert said he called her bachelor officer's quarters to see if she had gone home. The duty clerk had not seen Captain Russell, so Robert left a message. Around 4 p.m., Robert borrowed his housemate's car and drove to Pennsylvania to spend the weekend with his parents. 
personally threatened by this? Or did you wait During the first interview that I had with Robert Russell, he was uh, very calm, very businesslike, uh, wanted to assist the FBI in the investigation and provided me with multiple uh, uh, locations of where Shirley might be, who she may be associated with, what could have happened. Midnight phone calls. Russell thought it was possible someone had abducted and harmed her. Though Shirley had no enemies, the couple had experienced some trouble due to their interracial marriage. Russell told agents he and his wife frequently visited his hometown near Mahanoy City, Pennsylvania. One afternoon, while shopping, the Russells were harassed by racists. According to her husband, Shirley had been frightened, but another incident scared her even more. An unidentified man had called their house on base. Hello? The caller used racial epithets and threatened to harm the couple. How'd you get my phone? Whoever the caller was knew where the Russells lived. After the threatening phone calls, Robert told officials he felt Shirley might need protection for the times he couldn't be with her. shop near base. Robert picked out a 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic just two days before Shirley disappeared. Russell told agents he surprised Shirley with a gift on the day they met to clean their former quarters. According to Russell, Shirley was appreciative of the pearl-handled weapon. Thank you. You're welcome. Agents were suspicious of the story. As a Marine captain, Shirley already had a personal sidearm. If she felt unsafe, why would she need another gun? With Shirley and the gun nowhere to be found, that question would be difficult to answer. Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell had vanished from base housing on March 4th, 1989. Her husband was the last person to have seen her. Agents needed to corroborate his story. The FBI interviewed Marine Captain Patrice Gale. According to Robert Russell, on the day Shirley disappeared, Captain Gale had arrived at Shirley's former residence to pick her up for lunch at about 1.30. Gail confirmed this. Robert also told her that Shirley had gone for paint and hadn't returned. Captain Gail thought this was odd. Shirley never missed appointments. And this one had been especially important. Just a day earlier, Gail had accompanied Shirley to the base legal office to pick up her separation papers. Shirley planned to present them to Robert the day they painted their former quarters. This would make their separation official, and Shirley worried about Robert's reaction. Afterwards, she would need a friend to talk to and ask Captain Gale to meet her. When Shirley failed to show up, Captain Gale worried that Robert had done something to her friend. FBI agents checked Shirley's bachelor officer's quarters. The clerk had not seen her since Saturday, March 4th, the day she disappeared. On that same Saturday, Corporal Dan Carraway confirmed that Robert Russell had called looking for his wife. The corporal noted the time in his logbook is 3.30 p.m. About a half hour after he took the message, 
Caraway thought he saw Captain Russell. She was talking on the telephone. He recalled that she was wearing jeans and a maroon sweater. He wanted to give her the message that her husband had called, but he was distracted. By the time Carraway was free, the woman he thought was Captain Shirley Russell was gone. His description contradicted Robert Russell's statement that Shirley had been wearing a blue jogging outfit. The corporal also only saw the woman from behind. He never got a good look at her face. Agents doubted if she ever returned to her apartment. They found no trace that Shirley had changed her clothes or brought back the separation papers. Investigators questioned Russell's old neighbors. One of them said she saw a blue station wagon backed up to the Russell shed on the day Shirley had disappeared. She noted the time was 5 p.m. This was an hour later than Russell claimed he left for Pennsylvania. Investigators wondered if Robert Russell was mistaken or lying. Agent Alan Malinchek called the FBI in Pennsylvania to pin down Russell's whereabouts the rest of that day. Special Agent Michael Quirk of the Allentown office became co-case agent. He contacted Robert's parents. Robert Russell had traveled to uh, St. Clair, Pennsylvania on March 4th, 1989. And he uh, stayed with his family the, uh, the weekend of, of March 4th, uh, March 5th. FBI interviews with Russell's family confirmed he had arrived alone. None of them had seen Shirley. The FBI launched a media campaign seeking the public's help. Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell's photo was featured in television and newspaper stories. Leads began to pour in. Midway between Quantico and Robert Russell's hometown, a clerk in York, Pennsylvania, called federal authorities. The clerk reported that a young black woman had been in the store on the afternoon of Saturday, March 4th, the day Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell disappeared from Quantico. According to the clerk, the woman bought several items and paid with a check. The clerk asked the woman for identification. She produced a military ID card. She resembled photos the clerk had seen in the newspaper. Okay. Do you mind if I look at your bank receipts? The agent asked to see the checks received on that day. He found that none of them were written by Shirley Gibbs Russell. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer worked with the FBI on the case. He noted another detail that suggested the woman in the store was not Captain Russell. The color of the ID and the location of the picture in the ID described as belonging to Shirley Russell was the ID of a dependent military person, not of an active duty military person. There had been no activity since March 4th in Captain Russell's bank or credit card accounts, nor had she called her family or friends. Considering Shirley's stable character, her disappearance didn't make sense to Agent Alan Malinchik. She was the type of person who was going to do very well in the Marine Corps. Um, she would be promoted. Um, she had that capability. She was sharp. She was uh, squared away. She easy to make friends. Everybody that worked with her liked her. She had a lot of stability in her life with regard to church and family. Um, for her to just disappear of her own accord uh, just didn't make any logical sense. With no word from her or a kidnapper, agents believed it was likely that Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell was dead. They were now searching for her body. Dozens of Marines fanned out across the huge base. They searched hundreds of acres of dense woods the Marines used for training. They found no trace of the missing captain. 
Perhaps Robert Russell knew more about his wife's disappearance than he was telling the FBI. Agents asked him to submit to a polygraph examination. He agreed. The last time you saw her, you were painting your quarters, and it was sometime prior to 3 p.m. on Saturday, March 4th? That's correct. As before, agents found him to be cool and cooperative. For almost three hours, Robert Russell answered dozens of questions relating to Shirley's whereabouts. Mr. Russell, could you advise me where you... He was subjected to three separate exams. Was this red spot paint, Mr. Russell? Yes, it was. Each time, Robert Russell was found to be deceptive. When agents told him the results, Russell seemed unfazed, almost smug. He even consented to be fingerprinted. Perhaps he was aware that polygraphs were inadmissible in a federal court of law. Without a body, agents would need something stronger than a hunch to prove that Russell had killed his wife and disposed of her. In the spring of 1989, the FBI continued to hunt for the body of Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. In their search for answers, agents delved deeper into the background of their prime suspect, her husband, Robert Russell. Special Agent Michael Quirk learned that Russell was already married before he met Shirley. He had two children with his first wife, Pam. The marriage only lasted six years. In 1986, Russell told his wife that he wanted a divorce. He left Pam and their children on Christmas Day. Six months later, Robert married Shirley while they were both stationed at Paris Island, South Carolina. The FBI learned that Shirley was transferred to Quantico a short time later. They also learned that Robert told friends that the distance was hurting his marriage. He claimed he was leaving the Marine Corps to join Shirley and Quantico in order to stabilize their relationship. But agents discovered a different motive for the move. Agents believed it was unlikely Robert would voluntarily relinquish his rank as captain. Being in the Marine Corps was Robert's whole life and whole world. Military records showed that in February of 1988, while stationed at Gulfport, Mississippi, Robert's superiors found that his passion for the Corps did not seem to apply to its regulations. They issued Robert a less than honorable discharge for dereliction of duty and defrauding the government. He was escorted out of his office and was prohibited from taking anything with him except his own clothing. Although Robert was no longer a Marine, he moved into officers' quarters at Quantico based on Shirley's rank of captain. While Shirley supported him, Robert tried to get his life back on track by becoming a teacher at a nearby high school. But his drinking started to become excessive. He was getting drunk more often and staying out later. Robert? Shirley was distraught. She joined Al Anon, a support group for the loved ones of alcoholics. When Robert became physically abusive, Shirley finally left him. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer believed that Robert's problems left Shirley few alternatives. She realized that marriage was, was going nowhere, began to get counseling from a local counseling center that was made available to uh, members of the Marine Corps. She also consulted with a um, Navy lawyer 
to begin the divorce process. To investigators, Russell's instability and abusive behavior reinforced their belief that he was capable of killing Shirley. His personality could not tolerate the fact that this black woman, his wife, was a Marine Corps captain who was successful, who was succeeding in her, her career, and to top it all off, wanted to divorce him. Agents learned that during her separation, Shirley had sought refuge off base with her close friend, fellow Marine Captain Ann Mack. Captain Mack told Agent Malinchek that Shirley was afraid of her husband. She intended to leave him, but needed a place to stay. She had asked Captain Ann Mack if she could stay with her at her townhome in the Springfield, Virginia area. And uh, Captain Ann Mack uh, agreed and uh, laid out some ground rules about uh, Bob Russell not being there, uh, not coming into the house, uh, uh, nothing like that whatsoever. But it was not enough to keep Robert away from Shirley. Mack was worried about her. Mack told investigators that Robert was stalking Shirley. On several occasions, he showed up at the house early in the morning as Shirley was leaving. He harassed his wife until she agreed to spend some time with him. Mack said that Robert Russell was living off base. He had moved in with one of his new colleagues. An FBI agent checked the address. It was the home of Sandy Flint. Sandy Flint offered little. She said she knew nothing about Robert's missing wife. On the way out, the agent met Robert Flint, Sandy's father-in-law. He was a retired painter who had worked at the base at Quantico for 10 years. Mr. Flint told the agent about a conversation he had with Robert Russell two days after Shirley's disappearance. Robert Russell asked them how to clean up uh, stains from concrete floors. And the father-in-law had told Bob Russell that you could just use chlorine or soap and water, and that would pretty much clean it up or dilute it. And Bob had asked him, well, what if it's blood? And, and the father-in-law had said, well, you could use muriatic acid. Mr. Flint told the agent something else of interest. Sandy and her husband had recently separated. He suspected Sandy was now having an affair with Robert Russell. With each new person agents interviewed, they found more deception from Robert Russell. If Sandy was indeed involved with Russell, she might know if he had killed Shirley. Agents would inform her it would be unwise to obstruct a federal murder case. Sandy agreed to speak with the FBI. This time, agents found her to be far more cooperative. She described her role in Robert Russell's obsession. She had admitted to having a, an intimate affair with Bob Russell while Bob Russell was still married. Um, she advised us that she, at Bob's request, she had surveilled uh, Shirley Russell. She could report to Bob uh, Shirley's activities and whereabouts. He enlisted her as his spy. Sandy told the FBI Russell was convinced that Shirley was having an affair. He wanted to know where Shirley went and who she met. Sandy followed her everywhere, but found nothing to support his delusional fixation. And he was so compulsive, he wanted to catch his wife cheating. Of course, the irony of all of this is she wasn't cheating at all. It was he who was cheating on her. Robert was too far gone for logic. 
he refused to believe the assurances of his mistress. In his own mind, if he was cheating, so was Shirley. And he would go to any length to prove it. He told Sandy that he broke into his wife's car and planted a voice-activated recorder. When it failed to record anything incriminating, he decided he needed to get closer. Robert broke into Ann Mack's house to bug Shirley's bedroom. What happened next told Sandy that her lover's obsession had completely consumed him. Robert called his mistress from his wife's bedroom, speaking in a whisper. He won't believe where I'm at. He told Sandy he was drinking Shirley's wine and reading her journal. Then he said something she would never forget. He had informed her that if uh, Shirley comes missing, uh, it'll be me, I'll have taken care of her. And uh, she had said, we well, can't do that. Uh, you know, she's they're gonna look for her. He says, and if anybody questions you on this, uh, deny it, uh, don't even admit to the conversation we're having now. Sandy's statements were incriminating, but it was her word against his. To corroborate her story, the FBI needed physical evidence. We requested a consent search of Captain Ann Mack's residence. And he retrieved several items, and, and some of those items, one was a telephone and one was a wine glass. And when we sent those to the FBI laboratory for analysis, we were able to develop uh, Robert Russell's fingerprints on those items. The FBI now had its first piece of physical evidence to corroborate that Robert Russell obsessively stalked his wife. But without Shirley's body, it was still not enough to charge him with murder. In March of 1989, there was little evidence to link Robert Russell to the murder of his wife, Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Early in the investigation, agents learned the suspect had been having an affair with Sandy Flint. Flint now told the FBI more about the day Shirley Gibbs Russell disappeared. She said Robert Russell had borrowed her car, a blue station wagon, to drive to his parents' house in Pennsylvania. She remembered he left her house sometime after 4 p.m. Sandy thought this was strange because he could have used his own pickup truck. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer believed Russell borrowed her car that day to transport Shirley's body to Pennsylvania. The reason he asked to use that car was because he had an open bed pickup truck, the body was still in the storage shed, and he had to dispose of the body. And he couldn't do it in an open bed pickup truck, so he borrowed the closed station wagon of his girlfriend to dispose of the body. Agents hoped to substantiate this theory. They returned to Russell's former residence, where his neighbor had seen the same blue station wagon backed up to his shed. Investigators needed to take a closer look at the floor, where Lieutenant Colonel Hodges had seen the rust-colored stain. But the stain was gone, at least on the surface. And as they were chiseling the, uh, the whitewashed pieces of the concrete up, uh, Bob Russell had asked them what's going on, and they had told him that they're taking these samples to determine what the substance is on the concrete. And uh, uh, Mr. Russell had voluntarily told them, well, I, I had cleaned that up with some muriatic acid. The FBI lab confirmed that muriatic acid was present on the concrete. the same substance that Mr. Flint had suggested Russell use to remove blood from cement. Technicians found no trace of blood or paint on the chips. What could have been a key piece of forensic evidence had been destroyed. Agents hoped Sandy Flint's car would reveal more. FBI examiners scoured the station wagon inside and out.
It was unusually clean for an older car that had so recently made a round trip from Virginia to Pennsylvania. It turned out to be another dead end. As the investigation stalled in Virginia, Robert Russell split up with Sandy, packed his things, and moved to Pennsylvania to start a new life. The FBI's investigative focus turned north as well. Agents followed Robert's every move. They observed that while he relied on his parents for support, he was very close to his brothers, Mike and Ron. Agents approached the brothers on several occasions. Mike Russell agreed to meet with agents. He told them that the day after Robert arrived in Pennsylvania following Shirley's disappearance, Robert took Sandy Flint's station wagon to a nearby car wash. Robert and his brother thoroughly cleaned the inside of the car, vacuuming it and spraying it with deodorizer. Agents believed Robert's actions demonstrated his intent to remove any evidence that Shirley's body had been in the car. Mike Russell told agents he never saw a body. He did concede that his brother's behavior had seemed desperate since Shirley left him. Two months before she disappeared, Mike and his older brother, Ron, drove to Virginia to take away Robert's guns. Agent Quirk recalled that his brothers felt this was necessary to prevent Robert from hurting someone. He was depressed uh, in the fact that he was no longer in the Marine Corps that he loved the Marine Corps. He didn't have money. He was a captain in the Marine Corps. Uh, now he's a special education teacher. Uh, Shirley had uh, removed him from her checking account. So he was having problems financially. Circumstantial evidence was mounting. But the FBI lacked one crucial piece of evidence for their case. Shirley Gibbs Russell's body. The first question was where to look. Agents learned the answer from Robert Russell's first wife, Pam. Robert's boyhood home was in Schoolkill County, a rural mountainous region in northeastern Pennsylvania. Thousands of coal mines, mostly abandoned, are scattered throughout the rugged county. Some are hundreds of feet deep and partially filled with water. As a young man, suspect Robert Russell had spent much of his time hiking and hunting in the region. His family said he knew the place like the back of his hand. A search conducted in this terrain would be daunting, but nobody ever questioned whether it should be done. 150 people participated in the extensive ground search for Shirley Gibbs Russell in early May. Volunteers from the FBI, the Marines, the Naval Investigative Service, and the Pennsylvania State Police participated. None of them were more eager to find the missing Marine than her own peers from the United States Marine Corps. Nine helicopters and six transport trucks filled with Marines were deployed. Over three days, they searched 2,000 acres of land. They never found Captain Russell's body. Agents would soon develop a theory as to why the search was not more fruitful. Agent Quirk learned about a strange phone call Ron Russell received from his brother, Robert. Robert had asked Ron if he could get him some dynamite. And uh, Robert had stated that, it, that he couldn't get dynamite in Qu at Quantico because it was too expensive. And uh, Ron had asked Robert, why do, you, why do you want dynamite? And Robert's response was, I want to blow up Shirley. Ron never bought it. But agents now wondered whether Robert Russell had thrown Shirley's body into a mine shaft 
then sealed her grave with an explosion. The search did yield one surprising result. An agent found what appeared to be the grip of a gun handle. It was sent to the Firearms and Tool Marks Unit at the FBI's lab in Washington, D.C. for analysis. By comparing the samples to hundreds of other guns, examiners determined that it was consistent with the grip of a 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic. It was the same type of gun Robert Russell had purchased from a pawn shop on March 2nd, two days before his wife disappeared. Unfortunately, the tantalizing discovery would not help with the prosecution. Agents never found Robert's fingerprints on the gun part. To prosecutors, it looked as if the ex-Marine had covered his tracks well. Without a murder weapon or a body, it would be next to impossible to convict Robert Russell of murder. Very clear. After an investigation spanning two months, two states, and thousands of man hours, the FBI was no closer to arresting their prime suspect, Robert Russell, for the murder of his wife, Marine Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Though agents had gathered a significant amount of circumstantial evidence, Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer didn't have enough physical evidence to prosecute Russell for the crime. We didn't have a body, we didn't have eyewitnesses, we didn't have weapon, and it just took a tremendous amount of investigative skill and effort to put the pieces together, to go out and search out the leads, tremendous amount of hours and energy that these FBI agents took to gather the evidence. Authorities didn't even have enough evidence to make an arrest. Agents were frustrated, as were the hundreds of Marines whose lives had been touched by Captain Shirley Russell. It was like the loss of a child or, or a, a dear friend and there was nothing you could do about it. And what frustrated me so much was she was so close to being extricated from her, her bad marriage. And for her to be uh, killed, it still bothers me to this day. I mean, it just, it's just one of those things that you just never really totally get over. It looked as if Robert Russell was going to get away with murder. But Russell's past indiscretions would come back to haunt him. We had. Uh... Uh, been contacted by the Naval Investigative Service at Gulfport, Mississippi, that there was uh, some evidence in a, um, uh, in a locker there uh, that they had maintained from uh, when Bob was uh, discharged uh, uh, from the uh, Marine Corps. And so they sent it to us, and it turned out to be a floppy disk. It had been confiscated when Russell was relieved of duty in Mississippi a year before Shirley Russell disappeared. For security reasons, no service member who has been relieved of duty is allowed to go through their documents after dismissal. One of Russell's former superiors found the disc and read its menu of contents. One of those items that he saw on the menu was the word murder and he pushed the, uh, the mouse for that, on that word murder, and up came 26 steps, very detailed and elaborate steps, on how Robert Peter Russell was planning the murder of Captain Shirley Gibbs. Russell's plan clearly documented his intentions. The 26 steps was a, a very revealing piece of evidence because it showed the man's state of mind, his willingness to, to even contemplate murdering another human being, let alone his wife. Step one is leave Thursday, uh, January 18th for Paris Island. Well, who is that Paris Island? Shirley Russell. Make it look as if she left. Well, that's exactly what he tried to do when he did murder his wife. And then the last thing he says is uh, uh, blame it on her own kind obviously referring to her race. This is a man who um, clearly had the, the mental wherewithal and, and intent and motivation to do this kind of act. 
On February 8, 1991, the computer file convinced federal prosecutors to bring charges against Robert Peter Russell for the murder of his wife, Captain Shirley Gibbs Russell. Ironically, Russell was arrested in a prison. Need your stuff with us? He had recently taken a job as a substance abuse counselor at Pennsylvania's Graterford State Correctional Institution. New York. But prosecution would not be easy. Assistant U.S. Attorney Lawrence Lizer would have to assemble all the pieces of circumstantial evidence like a mosaic. Hopefully, the jury would see the portrait of a killer emerge. Assistant U.S. Attorney and co-prosecutor Michael Rich would help to prepare the case against Russell. It was clear they were going to have to make it on you know, circumstantial evidence. Uh, a, a lot of that circumstantial evidence was uh, as a result of what Bobby Russell had been saying and doing since his wife's disappearance in eight, 1989. So the plan was to assemble all that into some sort of coherent scheme and present that. Never before had the federal government attempted to try someone for first-degree murder based solely on circumstantial evidence. At trial, the prosecution asserted that Robert Russell intended to commit murder when he bought the 25 caliber Raven semi-automatic on March 2nd. Sweet, how much? Several of his co-workers reported that he had told them a 25 caliber is a perfect weapon. It leaves little evidence behind. He said there is virtually no blood spanner, and the bullet usually lodges in the body. On Saturday, March 4th, when Shirley gave him the separation papers, he refused to sign. Just after noon that day, the prosecution believed Robert Russell snuck up on Shirley in the shed. for nightfall before he could remove the body. To establish an alibi, he talked with a neighbor and lied to Shirley's friend about his wife walking to the base exchange to buy paint. Okay, that's probably a good idea. See. Around 4 p.m., he went to Sandy Flint's house and borrowed her station wagon. After night fell, he wrapped Shirley's body in a tarp and placed it in the back of the car. Their neighbors saw it backed up to the shed. He then drove four hours to St. Clair, Pennsylvania with the body in the back of the car. Once there, he knew exactly where to go. There were hundreds of abandoned mines to choose from. Then, Robert Russell, who had once sworn to uphold honor as a member of the Marine Corps, dumped his wife's body into a mine shaft. dynamite in to bury the evidence under thousands of pounds of rock. The jurors were convinced. On May 3rd, 1991, Robert Peter Russell was convicted of murdering his wife, Shirley Gibbs Russell. Robert Russell was sentenced to life. There is no parole in the federal system. He will never leave prison alive. A mysterious woman lures a businessman across state lines with the promise of a lucrative deal. 
When he vanishes, authorities turn to the FBI for help. Suspicions point to a bitter business rival, but the suspect stonewalls investigators. Agents would use state-of-the-art technology to find friends and lovers who might be willing to reveal the truth. wealthy businessman went to Florida to make one last deal before he retired, but he never returned home to his millions. Authorities examined who was closest to the victim and who stood to gain from his disappearance. But this time, conventional rules did not apply. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In a case that spanned the entire East Coast, agents would have to untangle a web of sex, money, and vengeance that led to murder. Newark International Airport in New Jersey. On Saturday, February 24th, 1996, Kiwi Airlines Flight 45 took off for West Palm Beach, Florida. 58-year-old Frank Black was on board. Black owned and operated a successful school bus and transportation company in Andover, New Jersey. Thank you. He had made millions and was on his way to Florida to meet a new industry contact. Black told his family and co-workers he would be home Monday in time for another meeting. He also told them that his contact in Florida, a woman named Mia Giordano, was to pick him up at the airport. She would take him to meet others involved in a lucrative business deal. Privately, Black hoped to retire after closing the deal. When Black failed to return on Monday, his family contacted the New Jersey State Police. Detective Sergeant Lee Liddy was one of the state detectives assigned the missing persons case. He was the kind of guy that he would always phone home. He always wanted to know what was going on with his business. He was a hands-on type of guy. Without Frank, the business really didn't run. And that's why they were concerned when they didn't hear from him. All of a sudden, he disappeared because Frank wasn't the kind of guy who would just walk away from his business. New Jersey investigators interviewed Black's daughter, Leanna, and his girlfriend and office manager, Sally Roberts. Leanna said her father had missed an important meeting with her to discuss the sale of his business. He also had not answered calls to his cell phone. Sally Roberts recalled that the woman from Florida, Mia Giordano, had phoned the office many times recently but never left her number. The Florida woman claimed to represent a company named Valdez Exporting. Giordano provided a description of herself so Black could recognize her at the airport. She said she was five foot one and blonde. A detective visited the travel agent who booked Black's trip. The agent confirmed that Black purchased a one-way ticket to Florida. He didn't bother to rent a car since his contact had arranged to pick him up. Airline records corroborated that Black had boarded the flight. But he had not registered at any hotels upon his arrival in West Palm Beach. An examination of Black's records revealed that his credit cards had been used after his arrival in Florida. To 
follow the credit card trail, New Jersey detectives contacted the Fort Pierce office of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. FDLE Special Agent Michael Driscoll was assigned the case. Frank Black's credit card was used at the Embassy Suites in Riviera Beach between approximately 1 in the morning and 2 in the morning. Okay, Now we're talking about from February 24th into February 25th. And then at 4 o'clock in the morning, his credit card, a different credit card, but his, Frank Black's credit card was used to purchase gas at a gasoline station in North Miami. To investigators, this seemed odd since he hadn't rented a car. The state agent interviewed the employee who had worked on February 25th. When shown a photo of Black, the attendant said he didn't recognize him. The station's pumps all had credit card slots. No one would have had contact with Black or whoever was using his credit card. The employee didn't recall seeing anyone fitting Mia Giordano's description. Driscoll contacted the Florida Secretary of State Corporation Division to get an address for Valdez exporting. Mia Giordano's company. Okay, catch you later. Bye. He found no such company registered in the state. He also attempted to locate Mia Giordano herself. We did a very extensive search to identify any Mia Giordano in Florida, and we couldn't find any, I believe, any Mia Giordanos in Florida, or any that would even come remotely close. And we checked Florida as well as New Jersey and with negative results. On March 1st, a detective from the New Jersey State Police traveled to Florida where Frank Black's trail ended. Nobody had heard from Black in five days. Detectives now believed the millionaire had met with foul play. Their most likely suspect, a woman calling herself Mia Giordano, was untraceable. Investigators' focus turned to the phone calls Black received on the days leading up to his trip to Florida. We obtained the phone records of Frank Black, which identified phone calls from a residence in Jupiter. And the residence in Jupiter was rented, it was a, a, a townhome rented by a girl identified as Lisa Costello. She wasn't blonde, but she was five foot one. Mia Giordano had described herself as being exactly that height. The calls from Lisa Costello matched the times when Mia Giordano allegedly phoned Black to set up the meeting in Florida. Mia Giordano was a fictitious figure. She never existed. And she was supposed to set up the deal with Frank Black. Mia Giordano was actually Lisa Costello. Investigators took Costello's photo to the hotel where Black's credit card had been used on February 25th. The resort was on the strip at Riviera Beach. The state agent asked to speak to the clerk who had been on duty the morning in question. While he waited, he checked the phone that had been used with Black's credit card. Like the gas pump, the phone required no signature from a customer, just a credit card. Anyone could have made the calls. Karen Voorhees had worked the front desk on the morning in question. But she did not recognize a photo of Frank Black. She did recall waiting on another customer that morning. At around 2 a.m., a dark-haired woman asked for a room. The hotel was booked, so she used a payphone several times to query other hotels. It was the same time Frank Black's credit card was used at the phone. Voorhees described the woman as being in her 30s with brown hair and standing a little over five feet tall. Driscoll showed Voorhees a photographic lineup of six women. Without hesitation, the clerk picked out Lisa Costello. 
Lisa Costello was now really the primary suspect. I mean, we did have some evidence on her that then uh, we checked the uh, car rental agencies by the West Palm Beach Airport and found out that Lisa Costello rented a car just shortly before the time that Frank Black's flight arrived. Investigators found the car at the airport rental lot. A subpoena allowed them to impound it for an evidence search by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. But examiners would find no trace of Frank Black in the car. There was no physical evidence linking Lisa Costello to the missing businessman. Florida investigators began covert surveillance on Lisa Costello. They followed the suspect for days to establish her routine and determine her contacts. They soon learned that Costello was dating a man named Alan Mackerley. Investigators began to tail Mackerley. Like Frank Black, he also owned a bus company in New Jersey, but was now living in Florida. The two men had known each other most of their lives. Over the years, Alan Mackerley and Frank Black built up a rivalry. The two bus companies are about 10 miles apart. So even though they each had their own contracts and their own business, they were always vying for the same contracts and the same business. Phone records indicated recent calls to Black from Mackerley's Florida home. This seemed strange since the two men were fierce rivals. Detectives went to speak with the manager of Black's bus company. Sally Roberts said Black and Mackerley used to be friends, but their business rivalry had made them enemies. She detailed the last time she had seen the men together. It was at an industry banquet in January of 1996. She and Frank were talking with friends when she saw Mackerley approaching. Angry that Black had stolen one of his major bus contracts, Mackerley threatened his rival. He said he was going to get him and put him under. That could mean put him out of business, and it could also possibly mean he was going to kill him someday. Black took the threat seriously. Afterwards, he wouldn't go to any meeting that Mackerley might attend, unless he had someone with him. Investigators contacted Mackerley to ask him if he had seen or spoken to Frank Black recently. Mackerley flatly denied calling him in the days preceding Black's trip to Florida. Him denying that and us knowing phone, rec phone calls have been made from his house to Frank Black's business obviously uh, indicated something uh, was wrong. Investigators believed that Mackerley and Costello had probably killed Frank Black, but they needed stronger proof. They turned to assistant state attorney, Robert Belange. One of the first investigative tools that the FDLE wanted to use was wiretaps. So you have to show uh, a really compelling reason for listening to someone's telephone conversations. So we drafted those applications and orders and obtained uh, an order allowing us to listen to Alan Mackerley's telephone conversations. Unfortunately, investigators heard very few phone conversations between Mackerley and Costello. This was because Costello was now living with Mackerley. If they were talking about Black's disappearance, it wasn't over the phone. In order to record any incriminating conversations, investigators would have to bug Mackerley's house. 
Assistant State Attorney Lawrence Merman hoped they had enough probable cause to get inside. Being able to actually enter someone's home and plant a listening device is extremely restrictive and the, and the probable cause that's required is very high. Uh, the situations that would warrant that are very limited. This case actually presented that situation. A judge signed the warrant, and investigators planted listening devices in Mackerley's home. They set up outside, watching and listening. Got it. Hopefully, the couple would discuss what happened to Frank Black. Alan Mackerley and Lisa Costello were extremely cautious. Investigators believe the couple knew they were listening. And every time that we would uh, hear them starting to talk, the, they would turn the radio up in the kitchen loud. So we probably have several hundred hours of uh, tapes with nothing but, but music on it. Once again, investigators came up empty-handed. Our chief assistant state attorney, Dave Morgan, had even commented to me after we failed to get anything on the wiretaps, it looks like Alan McAlee's gotten away with murder. Alan, what are you doing? With Black's body still oh, missing, McAlee and Costello could elude authorities as long as they maintained their silence. In June of 1996, Florida state agents believed that Alan McAlee and his girlfriend Lisa Costello had murdered 58-year-old millionaire Frank Black. But investigators had little evidence against the couple, and Black's body was still missing. They checked morgues in Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties where Black was last known to have traveled. There were no unidentified bodies matching Frank Black's description. If Mackerley and Costello had killed Black, they had covered their tracks well. Florida Department of Law Enforcement Special Agent Michael Driscoll expressed his frustration to his friend, FBI Special Agent Jay Miller. We used to play racquetball together, and he'd ask me about how this case was going, and I'd tell him, you know, a little bit about it, not, not a whole lot, it, and uh, he'd say, well, if you ever need a hand, and uh, I'd be happy to help out. In June of 1996, Special Agent Jay Miller asked to be assigned the case out of the FBI's Fort Pierce Resident Agency. And even though we were close friends, initially I did not know a lot of the details about uh, Frank Black's disappearance. But uh, as I could sense his frustration, I was able to elicit more information about the case. And uh, we were able then to come to an understanding that we needed to look at this thing again from the start. Though investigators believe McAlee killed Black over a disputed busing contract, wiretaps and listening devices had failed to tie him to any crime. Investigators' best lead was still Black's alleged meeting with Costello. Perhaps if subpoenaed and confronted with the evidence, she would turn on McAlee. It was a gamble that could jeopardize their entire case. By giving anyone, in this case Lisa Costello, a subpoena, it compels her to come in and give information, and it gives her immunity. Hypothetically, if she came in and admitted she killed Frank Black, she would be immune from that statement. You could not use that statement against her. On June 13, 1996, Lisa Costello appeared before a Florida grand jury. When questioned by state attorneys, she was uncooperative and hostile. The judge cautioned her that if she did not answer, she would be jailed for contempt.
Costello ignored his warnings. Investigators believed her refusal to cooperate confirmed she was involved in Black's disappearance. But it would take more than a hunch to solve the case. The gamble to subpoena Costello backfired. Now that Mackerley's closest ally was sitting behind bars, investigators had no potential witnesses to turn on the suspected murderer. Lacking further leads or physical evidence, the case against Mackerley might never make it to trial. Special Agent Michael Driscoll and his team were determined to keep this from happening. We heard information that, let's just say from a confidential source, that there was a witness who wanted to talk but was concerned about, one, that witness's own involvement, and two, Alan McAlee's violence. Felt that Alan McAlee was a violent person and that maybe there'd be retaliation if this unknown and unidentified witness would, would talk. That witness was Bill Anderson. A former Marine pilot, Anderson was one of Alan McAlee's closest friends. Agents interviewed him at his home in Florida, just down the street from Mackerley. Anderson had also owned a bus company in New Jersey and had been a commercial pilot after a decade of military service. So now we had two investigators, Driscoll and myself, and a prosecutor, a land jay, all being Marines, and then the person who we believe could be the key to solving the case, Bill Anderson being a Marine. And so I think there was some camaraderie right there from the start. Investigators felt that bond would help them develop Anderson as a witness. He told the agents his friendship with McAlee had been strained recently, but he was reluctant to detail McAlee's relationship with Frank Black. The agents felt Anderson knew something that could break the case wide open. There was a little hesitancy on his part. We took it easy on him and uh, gave him a little space, gave him the opportunity to do whatever he needed to do, to confer with counsel or whatever. In our minds, we knew that we were talking to the man that had the answers, and he wasn't telling us. The agents met with Anderson on many occasions and slowly won his confidence. Thank you very much for your time. They knew he was loyal to his friend Alan McAlee, but they felt his sense of honor would eventually cause him to turn. Despite Anderson's lingering doubts, agents believed he was ready to talk by early August. They suspected a subpoena would help him justify turning against his friend. In my experience, good, honest, hard-working people that, that flew fighter jets in the Marine Corps would have a difficult time going under oath before the whole world and God and lying about it. Investigators had to take the chance. Like Costello, if Anderson had any part in the crime, his statements could not be used to prosecute him for murder. Five months after the disappearance of millionaire Frank Black, investigators had little evidence to support their theory that Black was murdered by his business rival, Alan McAlee. Looking for a fresh lead, investigators subpoenaed McAlee's close friend, Bill Anderson. Anderson had been reluctant to talk, but after a month, the former Marine's sense of honor prevailed. He began by telling investigators that Alan McAlee had purchased a plane earlier that year. McAlee asked Anderson to become his private pilot, since Anderson had experience flying fighter jets and commercial airliners. In exchange, Anderson could use McAlee's plane as he wished. In March of 1996, while staying at a hotel in Leesburg, Florida, to supervise repairs on the plane, Anderson was contacted by McAlee. His friend said he needed him to take the plane out over the ocean. Anderson explained that the aircraft would be grounded for several more days. 
He suggested they rent another plane. McAuley insisted on using his own plane. He didn't want anybody else to know about the flight. Anderson asked why. McAuley told Bill that he had shot Frank Black and that they had wrapped his body up in plastic, that they had taken the body out in the ocean and thrown it out in the ocean, and that the, the bag did not sink. And uh, he went on to tell Bill that it, it didn't sink, so he took a knife and stuck some holes in it, and uh, the body did sink. McAuley told Anderson he was worried that the body had surfaced. He wanted to fly over the area to make sure it hadn't. Anderson refused. Anderson was shocked. I mean, I, I think he was truly shocked. Anderson, again, was in the bus business, as was McAuley and Black. And uh, Anderson and Black were not friends. Uh, Anderson did not like Black in the least either. But still, over a business rivalry, you don't kill somebody. According to Anderson, McAuley murdered Black in the foyer of his house. The former Marine pilot confirmed what investigators had suspected all along. It was the big break in the case. I mean, this was the moment we were all waiting for. And <clears throat> I remember explaining to him right away that, Bill, we're going to have to do a covert recording of you rehashing this conversation with Alan McAuley. Without a body or murder weapon, they would need McAuley's confession on tape. Anderson's testimony was good, but in court it would be his word against McAuley's. Anderson told prosecutor Robert Belange that he was reluctant to wear a wire. He was afraid of McAuley because he admitted that he had just killed someone. And McAuley had also told him about a, a, an acquaintance up in New Jersey that got convicted of a crime because someone wore a wire. And he told Bill Anderson, if anyone ever wore a wire on me, I'd kill them. The investigators promised Anderson police protection. He agreed to wear the wire. The plan was to lure McAuley to Anderson's house. You'll be okay, so don't worry about it. Yeah, this is confident. This is well concealed. FBI techs wired Anderson for sound and hid a video camera in the kitchen. When the equipment was in place, Anderson called McAuley. He told him he'd been served a subpoena and wanted to talk about what he should do. McAuley said he would be right over. In case something went wrong, Agent Driscoll would remain hidden in the house to protect Anderson. When the team outside saw McAuley approaching, they would radio Driscoll to hide. Yeah. Well, in minutes. While waiting, investigators spotted telephone repairmen. McAuley was paranoid about being bugged. If he saw the workers, he might think they were undercover agents. We knew that if he came to that house and saw these telephone company trucks, that it would have been all over as far as the investigation. McAuley would be there any minute. The investigators quickly ordered the repairman to leave. They then concealed the dig site. The investigators made it back to the car just before McAuley pulled up. The investigators tried to alert the men in the house, but they received no response. They radioed again. Still nothing.
They had no way to know if Driscoll had received their call. He hadn't. The agent had seconds to hide. Anderson led Mackerley to the kitchen and sat down at the table as planned. He showed Mackerley the subpoena. Mackerley was hesitant to talk. I mean, he wouldn't talk loudly. He was pointing to the walls and saying, no, whispering like this, no, no, nobody knows. Whispering so that he couldn't be heard in Anderson's house. Not that he suspected Bill Anderson, but because he expected that the police were everywhere. They were. Detective Liddy and the others listened to McAuley and Anderson from the car. They had a discussion about what Bill Anderson was to testify to and whether or not Bill Anderson should lie for Alan McAuley. Bill Anderson even asked Alan McAuley that if he did uh, refuse to testify and was put in jail if Alan Mackerley would come forward and then tell the truth, and Alan Mackerley assured him that he would. Mackerley didn't want to continue talking in the house. He led Anderson outside. Anyone else where you told me. No, no. This whole thing was supposed to take place at Bill Anderson's kitchen table and no place else. And so when he heard Alan Mackerley say, let's take a walk, uh, we were concerned that he was walking Bill Anderson out somewhere to eliminate him. He told anyone else what he told me. No, nobody. The property was if large lied, and covered with dense good. foliage. Will you come they could have walked anywhere. But McAuley unknowingly walked Anderson close to the surveillance team. My car is parked only a matter of probably uh, 80 or 100 feet from McAuley and Anderson, and we could hear distinctly on the transmitter their footsteps as they walked through the gravel and they walked closer to my vehicle with very little coverage concealing my, uh, my vehicle. The four of us sat there frozen in our car wondering, is this whole thing going to be blown because he's going to see us? Their case and their cooperating witness were in jeopardy. I'm sorry. If the investigators were discovered, they might not be able to protect Anderson from McAuley's rage. Investigators in Florida watched as cooperating witness Bill Anderson met with murder suspect Alan McAuley. Anderson was wearing a wire trying to get McAuley to discuss the murder of Frank Black. New Jersey detective Lee Liddy feared what McAuley might do if he caught a glimpse of the nearby investigators. The two of them walked outside, which was very tense for all the investigators involved because at this point we have no control over what happens, where they go, or what they say. And because they were walking, and because of the pant leg of Bill Anderson rubbing and the movement of the clothes, it was very difficult to pick up conversation. So at that point, we really weren't sure what was happening. Before McAuley could spot the surveillance team, Anderson steered him away. Investigators now had incriminating statements on tape, but not a direct confession. They needed more. McAuley's alleged accomplice, Lisa Costello, remained in jail. She had been charged with contempt of court three months earlier for refusing to honor her subpoena. Agents would seek information from her friends to increase the pressure on the hostile witness. They interviewed Costello's former roommate. She said Costello used to deal cocaine and the sedative rufinol, which is odorless and tasteless. Depending on the dose, rufinol can relax a person or render them unconscious. FDLE Special Agent Michael Driscoll believed Costello sedated Frank Black with the drug. We suspected, matter of fact, from day one, that at some point Lisa and Frank Black 
may have gone to dinner or for drinks, and she was able to do that because he would not, he, Frank Black would not willingly or knowingly go into Alan McAuley's house. Hoping this information might pressure her into talking, a prosecutor met with Lisa Costello in jail. He told her that if she didn't cooperate, she would not have immunity. She could be charged with murder. Costello remained silent, despite the warnings of prosecutor Robert Belanger. And Lisa Costello could have walked out of that jail cell any day simply by coming out and honoring that subpoena and telling us what she knew about the case. But she was a tough enough uh, witness that she sat in jail on a civil contempt. Despite Costello's silence, investigators pressed on. Assistant State Attorney Lawrence Merman felt they were ready to arrest. We had a, uh, an ear witness to a confession who was a very close friend of the defendant. We had a motive, we had circumstantial evidence. It was a very strong case. On August 29th, agents began aerial surveillance on Alan McAuley. A ground team assembled around the perimeter of the suspect's house. They made sure he was alone inside. That evening, the arrest team positioned themselves by his door. They would wait until he emerged to take him down in the open. Hold him right there! Hold him right there! When he stepped out with his dog, the team struck. The stunned suspect offered no resistance. Seven months after Frank Black vanished, Alan McAuley was arrested for kidnapping and murder. With no physical evidence, prosecutors prepared for a difficult trial. When McAuley's arrest hit the news, they received a call from a man with information on the case. The man agreed to give a statement. Robert Senadasian was Alan McAuley's son-in-law. He said that he'd received a call from McAuley on February 25th, the day after Black arrived in Florida. McAuley asked him to come over to help him clean his house. When Senadasian arrived on Monday, February 26th, he saw that McAuley and Costello had already begun major renovations in the foyer. The carpet had been ripped up and parts of the wall had been removed. Sanadasian told prosecutor Robert Balanje that McAuley explained why. Alan McAuley told Rob Sanandasian, Frank Black was at my home last Saturday. And even Sanandasian knew the relationship between Alan McAuley and Frank Black and expressed some surprise. Why would, why would Frank Black be at your home? And Alan clearly didn't want to talk about it. He just said, given the O.J. Simpson trial, DNA evidence, we got to make sure there's not even a hair of Frank Black's found in this home. Sanadasian swore that he never saw any blood. Special Agent Miller asked if Sanadasian had questioned McAuley about what had happened. His response was something to the effect that he didn't have to ask his father-in-law, that he knew something really bad had occurred there in the house, and that they were, in fact, cleaning up a mess. They used an industrial vacuum cleaner to clean the entire area. Then McAuley asked Sanadasian to help him haul the debris to the local dump. Sanadasian told investigators that he and McAuley discarded sheetrock carpeting and even the vacuum cleaner in the Martin County landfill. His statement corroborated Bill Anderson's story. Anderson told us that McAuley had told him that he had killed Frank Black in the entry to his house. And now we had Sandasian telling us that immediately 
after Frank Black's disappearance, he was summoned to that house to do a remodeling job or a, a makeover of the foyer area right where Anderson states Mackerley said he shot Frank Black. In the middle of August, an evidence recovery team arrived at the landfill. Based on records, investigators were able to determine where the items were likely dumped six months earlier on February 26th. The recovery team searched for anything that could be traced back to Mackerley's home. For three hot days, investigators scoured a specific area of the landfill. The landfill uh, management was able to determine by the date exactly where it was. And it was in a spot that was actually feasible and possible that we'd find it. So uh, we did that. We got the equipment uh, with the sheriff's office, crime scene, and so forth. And we dug it up. And we found carpeting that we believed was from Mackley's residence. Investigators found portions of sheetrock and a vacuum cleaner that matched the description Sanitation had given. They brought the items to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Forensics Laboratory for analysis. Despite their strong suspicions, lab analysts were unable to conclusively match any of the items to Mackerley's house. Technicians also processed Mackerley's foyer and retrieved traces of what appeared to be blood. Unfortunately, DNA markers found in the samples could not be exclusively matched to Frank Black's DNA. It was another dead end. Investigators still had no physical evidence. Agents pressed on, continuing to build a strong circumstantial case for state prosecutor Belange by further corroborating Sanadazian's story about the cleanup. The FBI went to Walmarts and Kmarts and got receipts where Alan Mackerley was buying bleach and Comet and cleaning supplies and trash bags and duct tape and all the tools and implements he needed to clean up a crime scene. Just before trial, investigators received disturbing news. Martin County jail inmates claimed that Mackerley had hired someone to kill Bill Anderson. Mackerley knew that if he could prevent Anderson from testifying, prosecutors would have to drop their case. Early in 1997, murder suspect Alan McAuley was held without bond for the murder of Frank Black. While he was behind bars, investigators learned he had ordered the murder of witness Bill Anderson. As of that point, uh, the security for Bill Anderson tremendously increased and we began making arrangements uh, to have Bill uh, and his wife go into the uh, Federal Witness Protection Program. McAuley's would-be hitman would not be a reliable witness in court, so attempted murder for hire charges against McAuley were dropped. Alan McAuley's trial began on January 20th, 1998. Mr. Even Manchin, without the victim's body, Florida State Alan Prosecutor Mackley Robert Belanger was confident Frank in the case. There is case law going back to old England where murderers have been prosecuted uh, without a body successfully, uh, and the courts have said that we don't reward people because they successfully disposed of the body. You can still prove death through circumstantial evidence like any other fact in the case by a person's habits and routines. Uh, by the fact that they didn't pack for a long trip, um, by declarations of intent, I'm going to go to Florida. Uh, all these things uh, combined demonstrated pretty conclusively that Frank Black was dead. Nevertheless, that is a, a source of frustration. Mr. Mackerley told me the that prosecution's the main witness, Bill Anderson, Black recalled what he knew about Frank Black's murder. Prosecutors filled in the gaps and detailed the events of February 24th, 1996, the last day Black was seen alive. Mackerley's lover, Lisa Costello, picked up Frank Black at the West Palm Beach Airport that evening.
She took him to Mackerly's house on the pretense of meeting other business partners. Black was unaware that he had just stepped into the home of his bitter rival. So how long have you been in the busing business? While Costello and Black discussed the lucrative business deal, prosecutors believe Costello dropped a capsule of Rufinol into his drink. Black would not have noticed. The powerful sedative is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. The two talked while Costello waited for the drug to take effect. As planned, McAuley took over at that point. He had Costello remove Black's wallet. Later, they would use his credit cards to create a false trail for police. Black was powerless due to the heavy sedative. Finally in control of his rival, McAuley's hatred boiled over. In the foyer, he put a gun to Black's head. Alan? Alan! McAuley had to get rid of the evidence. He wrapped the body and murder weapon in plastic. Using one of his power boats, he would later dump the body about 16 miles offshore. Body out about 20 miles. Anderson testified that McAuley said he had to stab through the plastic in Black's body several times to get it to sink. He then returned home to finish cleaning up. He tore out anything that had been stained by blood or human tissue. Using bleach, they scrubbed the entire area clean. Anderson's testimony was bolstered by powerful circumstantial evidence. Phone calls linking McAuley and Black, Robert Sanadagian's story of the cleanup, and covert recordings from Anderson's house. Thunder will rise. How do you find a defendant? It was enough to convince the jury. On February 4th, 1998, they found Alan McAuley guilty of kidnapping and murder. After McAuley's trial, prosecutors turned to Lisa Costello. When I looked, I saw the dead body of Faced with murder charges, she finally gave a full statement as to the events that led to Frank Black's death. Ultimately, she entered a plea to third-degree murder and false imprisonment, which are lesser-included offenses. She was sentenced to 10 years in the Florida State Prison. An appeals court overturned McAuley's kidnapping conviction, finding that Frank Black traveled to Florida on his own volition. But the murder conviction stood. Alan McAuley was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Although Frank Black's body has not yet been recovered, his killer, Alan McAuley, will never go free. In the 1990s, a close-knit immigrant community was terrorized by one of its own. Those who turned to the police for help found themselves threatened or killed. Despite the risk, two men refused to back down. Their testimony could help end the killing if the FBI got close enough to uncover one man's deadly business.
Many immigrants escape the poverty of India to start new lives in the United States. Most dream of a better life for their families. One twisted the American dream into a nightmare. When people started turning up dead in New York's Indian community, law enforcement struggled to link fraud and murder to one powerful man. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When the promise of the American dream was shattered by murder and corruption, the FBI provided hope to those people who had seen their lives and families torn apart. July 9th, 1995. Gas station attendant Kulwant Singh commuted to a gas station in the Bronx to work the late shift. Less than a year earlier, he had arrived in New York from a poor town in India, hoping to make a better life for himself and his family. That night, he disappeared. In October, the missing man's brother, Manmohan Singh, traveled to the U.S. to find him. He hadn't heard from his brother in months. It wasn't like him not to write or call. He began his search in Queens at the address of one of his brother's friends. His name was Satinderjit Singh. His family was from the same village as the missing attendants. Although this friend had the same last name, he was not related. Like many members of the Sikh religion, Satinderjit took the surname Singh, which means liar in the Punjabi language. Satinderjit said a missing persons report had been filed, but police had found no trace of his friend. He advised the new arrival to be careful who he talked to. Searching for the brother would be dangerous. Manmohan visited the gas station in the Bronx where his brother had worked. He spoke to an attendant, but the man was afraid to respond. His supervisor made it clear that no one should be asking questions. The employee was instructed to keep quiet. But Manmohan was persistent and convinced the attendant to meet him at a diner a few Look, days later. I can only be here for a few minutes. I know you're looking for him. The attendant said the missing brother had been accused of stealing from the gas station. And he was coming in to Whether or not the allegations were true, they had made the station's owner angry. The attendant believed Manmohan's brother had been kidnapped and probably killed. By March of 1997, a year and a half after his brother's abduction, Manmohan took a job at a gas station in New York. He worked nights so he could spend his days secretly gathering information. He believed he knew who was responsible and was ready to go to the police. Hey, I need some oil. Then, on the night of March 16, 1997, he was silenced. Brooklyn North homicide detectives received a call from a customer who found the body.
They photographed the crime scene to record its condition, then gathered evidence. They collected two shell casings from a 9mm Ruger. Detectives found the register had been robbed, but were surprised that the thief had left some cash behind. Police also found no fingerprints. Detective Tony Brazada concluded that robbery was not the prime motive. We examined the scene and it looked like it was a typical gas station robbery at the beginning, but then examining the scene thoroughly, it seemed that it was more like an assassination or a this person was a target because he was shot very close range behind the head and he was on his knees. Detectives visited the Sikh temple where the funeral was being held. They knew this immigrant community was wary of outsiders, but hoped to find friends of the victim willing to talk. Satinjajit Singh stepped forward. He told detectives that he knew the slain man. Detectives explained that without cooperation, the killer would likely go free. Although he knew he was jeopardizing his own safety, he promised to meet with detectives and help them in any way he could. The following day, Satinderjit Singh came to the police station as promised. Yes, sir. He brought with him another witness, Savjit, who was also willing to talk. They told detectives they believed a wealthy and powerful Indian man named Dinza had ordered the murder of their friend, as well as the abduction of their friend's brother. Dinza was a corrupt and ruthless businessman who was well known in the Sikh community. Like many others, he had come to the U.S. from India in the mid-1980s with only a few dollars in his pocket. But his story was different than most. He had amassed an empire of more than 50 gas stations in and around New York City. And, uh which was common with all the... The witnesses knew several of Dinza's employees and explained to Detective Teddy Braun that the millionaire would stop at nothing to protect his business. This whole thing was fear. He used the fear tactic that he had this community petrified him. I mean, to the point where he could walk in and do something in front of hundreds of people and no one's gonna say nothing. Police also learned that Dinza was no stranger to crime. His record included convictions for felony assault, kidnapping, robbery, gas pump fraud, and weapons possession. He'd served time, but always managed to get back on the street to run his mafia-style operation. Within the Sikh community, Dinza was known as the Indian Godfather. The witnesses said Dinza's empire was a family affair, with Dinza's brother a member of the inner circle and an enforcer for the organization. And then I Sarjit worked, uh, had seen for himself just how ruthless the brother minutes. could be. In 1993, outside a Queen's restaurant, the informant witnessed Dinza's brother arguing with a man. The disagreement ended with Dinza's brother shooting him in close range. Sarjit rushed to the victim's side, but it was too late. Dinza's brother was spirited out of the country to India. He was never captured. The witnesses now told the detectives that they'd heard the brother would soon be returning to America. They were risking their lives talking to police, but they couldn't let the violence continue. Both promised to report when Dinza's brother arrived. He's going to be coming back to the United States because Dinza's company was getting so big that Dinza needed another hand. And Dinza was the type of person where he'd rather have family hands on than outsiders when it came to his money. True to their word, in May of 1997, the witnesses told police that Dinza's brother was back in New York. Police set up outside the warehouse of Dinza's headquarters in Brooklyn waiting for his brother to arrive. Both witnesses were present to assist police with identifying the murder suspect. Alpha 
you have a possible target, stand by. Armed with an arrest warrant, police surrounded the building and cordoned off all entrances, including the back doors of the warehouse. From the surveillance van, Satinjajit confirmed that it was Dinza's brother heading for the front door. We have a target entering the building. Moments later, officers reported that shots were fired inside the building. They held their posts, waiting for orders. Ready? We're going in. Let's go. Officers forcibly entered the front of the building. Three men raced out the back door into the hands of police. The men were Dinza's brother, his cousin, and his nephew. All three were arrested. Quickly securing a search warrant, police confiscated firearms. Seven pistols, a shotgun, and a silenced machine gun. As they loaded the contraband into a police car, Dinza himself arrived at the scene. He protested the seizure, claiming that the building and guns were his property. But the guns were illegal. Police arrested him on weapons possession charges. They took him to the 112th precinct, where Dinza was booked and fingerprinted. Police pressured him to cooperate. They had two witnesses who would testify against him and his brother for murder. Insisting he was innocent, he refused to talk. Dinza was held in the Brooklyn Correctional Facility awaiting a bail hearing. But incarceration did not prevent the murder suspect from running his empire. Speaking in Punjabi so guards couldn't understand him, he coerced employees and acquaintances to find out who dared to testify against him and his brother. Besides witness statements, police had little other evidence. Dinza would be out on bail shortly. If he discovered the identity of the witnesses, they might not testify. Then, the murder and weapons charges against the brothers would have to be dropped. In May 1997, New York City police arrested two East Indian brothers who had been terrorizing their immigrant community for years. Except for the statements of two witnesses, investigators had little evidence against them. But they believed that Dinza was the ringleader and that he had ordered two murders and a kidnapping. Dinza had posted bail on May 4, 1997, just days after his arrest. But his brother remained held on a murder charge in New York City's Rikers Island prison. Through informants, Dinza had learned the identity of the two witnesses against him. If they continued to cooperate with the police, he, his brother, and his multi-million dollar gas station empire would be in jeopardy. Okay, One of the witnesses, so Satinderjit Singh, was close with several employees of the suspected murderer. He knew a great deal about how Dinza ran his $60 million gas station chain. He said that Dinza rigged pumps, skimmed profits, and ordered people abducted if they talked. Detectives believe the information was compelling enough to seek an indictment. In early June of 1997, investigators met with the assistant U.S. attorney to explore Dinza's illegal activities. NYPD detective Teddy Braun explained how Dinza's pump rigging scheme worked. 
Denzel owned like 53 gas stations, and uh, he had this unique skimming system. And what it did was it regulated the amount of gas that was pumped into a consumer's vehicle. So if you would have went in and asked for $10 worth of gas, he'd be able to set up that machine where it can give you 80%, 90%, whatever percent that he wanted to give you, and the rest would be saved. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell learned that not only was Dinza's empire corrupt, it was extensive. The NYPD informed us that Dinza um, had, among other things, an organization built around um, uh, pump fraud, basically ripping off customers at his gasoline stations throughout the New York and New Jersey area, by which he generated millions of dollars in income. That he protected that pump fraud activity through a pattern of violent uh, crime, including murder. On June 18th, just as the federal investigation was beginning, witness Satinjit Singh was shot to death in Queens. It was the day before Dinza's brother, suspected of murder, was scheduled to attend the hearing. At the crime scene, a neighbor told police he had witnessed the crime. He had been outside at the top of his stoop when the shooting took place. Since his apartment lacked air conditioning, he was watching a Mets game on his front porch. He was distracted by what appeared to be a traffic dispute. neighbor described the shooter as a tall, African-American male, but he never saw his face. The slain man's cousin was sitting beside his relative in the car when he was killed. The cousin told police it had all happened so fast. He was too shaken to remember any details. Forensic technicians photographed the scene. They collected shells that had been fired from a nine millimeter handgun. No other physical evidence was found. Nothing to prove that Dinza was responsible. Investigators believed that Dinza would continue to use any means necessary to protect his millions. They needed some way to stop him. NYPD detectives turned to Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell for guidance. He would refocus the investigation to take advantage of the federal RICO statute, the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, a law used to prosecute organized crime. This looked like had all the hallmarks of a racketeering prosecution. It had um, an organization with uh, leadership it had racketeering activity which generated income, and it had a pattern of criminal activity which spanned several years, almost a decade. This would widen the scope of the investigation considerably. The assistant U.S. attorney called on the FBI for help. Special agent in charge Kevin Donovan from the FBI's New York field office worked the case. The FBI was planning on conducting a traditional organized crime investigation that would focus on uh, development of cooperating witnesses, use of cooperating witnesses, review of records, and search warrants to focus on the multiple acts of violence and the multiple acts of fraud. That would not be easy. In order to develop new witnesses, agents would have to ensure the safety of those who came forward. As long as Dinza Singh was able to intimidate witnesses through violence, threats of violence, and homicides, our investigation would be very limited. We needed to make sure that no other individuals who would cooperate with us would be hurt by Dinza Singh. News of the most recent killing spread quickly through the Sikh community. The other witness, Sarvjit, and his family prepared to leave town. Investigators pleaded with him to allow the FBI to place him under protective custody but he insisted on taking his wife and two small children away from New York. 
Despite investigators' best efforts, Dinza had intimidated another witness. To the Sikh community, the police and the FBI seemed powerless to protect them. In the summer of 1997, the FBI was on the trail of a violent businessman named Dinza. Investigators believed he had already killed two men, kidnapped a third, and scared another out of New York. They needed an informant close to Dinza to get enough evidence to arrest him. I will get back. But special agent in charge Kevin Donovan found that Dinza was well protected. The major hurdle that the FBI and the New York City Police Department had to overcome was an inability to develop cooperating witnesses and informants early on due to language difficulties and due to the fact that most of the individuals who worked at City Gas Corporation were not willing to come forward because of Dinza Singh's threats of violence and his acts of violence that were well known throughout the community. Dinza now threatened the life of another member of the Sikh community. Balwant Singh was close friends with the witness who had fled the city with his family. The man was terrified. Dinza had come after him to find the one remaining witness. He remained holed up in his apartment with his wife and daughter for three days before he finally called police. He reached the Queen's Homicide this Unit, morning, which was investigating the murder of Satinderjit Singh, a witness the, against Dinza. Um, Balwan told police that he had attended the slain man's funeral. There, he was approached by one of Dinza's men. He asked Balwan where the other witness was hiding. Dinza wanted to discuss the witness's testimony face to face. Balwant refused to tell him anything. But now, he feared for his own life. Police told him that they would discuss the possibility of providing him and his family with protective custody. Two detectives would be right over. Since the funeral, he had been ignoring the demands of the construction company he owned. Mr. Singh, please. Hello? Yes, Mr. Singh. Yeah. Here the when the company called, he agreed to run an urgent errand. He left his frightened family, promising he'd return as soon as he could. He knew Dinza's reputation. It would be difficult to avoid him for very long. Just minutes after pulling out, the man noticed a sedan that seemed to be following him. It was Dinza. Balwant didn't want to take any chances, so he returned home. Dinza sped away. As detectives headed for Balwant's apartment, they received a page. It was a coded message from their supervisor, asking them to call in immediately. Lacking a cell phone, they stopped to make the urgent call. While the detective was on the phone, he noticed an Indian man watching him closely from a car. He 
decided to investigate. The detectives asked the driver for his license and registration. It was Dinza. Mind stepping out, sir? When detectives asked to search his car, he agreed. Inside, they found some gas receipts. In the trunk, detectives also found electronic gauges for gas pumps. Dinza possessed nothing that was illegal. Since there was no outstanding warrant for his arrest, detectives let him go. The detectives were called away on an emergency. They never made it to the informant's home that day. The next morning, the man's frightened wife called police. Her husband had taken refuge in a friend's gas station. He waited anxiously for them to arrive and was relieved to see them pull up. His wife and daughter were picked up moments later. That evening, the family was taken to an undisclosed hotel outside of New York. The family would hide there under police protection until Dinza could be arrested. Detectives informed Balwant that they had run into Dinza near his neighborhood. They asked if he could verify the man's identity from a photo. Balwant identified him instantly. Investigators had one more witness in their case against the deadly businessman, but they still lacked sufficient evidence to make an arrest. In July of 1997, FBI agents and NYPD detectives believed gas station mogul Dinza was the man behind the murders of two Indian immigrants and the disappearance of a third. Investigators had little evidence to prove their theory. And Dinza's intimidation had silenced most witnesses. But a few among the community were tired of living in fear. At the end of July, Brooklyn North homicide detective Teddy Braun interviewed a source close to Dinza. During the interview with the confidential informant, my partner Tony Rosada came across a name Marvin, who was linked as Dinza Singh's strong arm. The man's full name was Marvin Dodson. He was a 35-year-old African-American male. Detectives discovered that he had an arrest record for illegal firearms. Any of these men look familiar? They showed a photo lineup to the cousin men? of the slain witness who was in the car when the shooting occurred. Mm -hmm. you recognize any of these men? He immediately identified Dodson yeah. as the gunman. Yeah. Detective Anthony Brizada now began searching for Marvin Dodson. Okay. My partner and myself put together a list of uh, various locations, like about six or eight locations where he hung out, uh, his residence, his relatives. On July 4th, 1997, police cornered Dotson in a Queens neighborhood. Marvin Dotson! Turn off your ignition! Throw your keys out of the window! Now! Do it! Go by the car, sir! They arrested him and took him to the station. Open the door, do it! Stop! Dodson agreed to testify against Dinza in return for a lighter sentence. On Sunday morning, July 6, 1997, Dodson and his attorney met with Queens homicide detectives, the assistant U.S. attorney, and the FBI. Dodson confessed that he had been hired by Dinza for the murder. Dodson said the plan to kill one of the witnesses began on May 18, 1997. 
At the time, Dinza had just been released on bail. Dodson would be the trigger man, hired to kill the witness scheduled to testify against Dinza and his brother. First, they picked up the murder weapon, a 9mm Ruger. The same caliber of shell casings were later collected at the crime scene. Dodson told investigators that Dinza then ordered him to hire a driver for the hit. Go ahead and tell us the story. Dinza's next move was to conduct surveillance of the witnesses. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell recalls that Dinza provided Dodson with all the information he'd need to get to Satinderjit Singh. He gave Mr. Dodson the address where Satinderjit Singh lived, the license plate number to his vehicle, and instructed um, Mr. Dodson to watch Satinderjit Singh and kill him at the first opportunity. What do you do with the gun? On June 18, 1997, Dodson received a phone call from Dinza. His boss told him that the witness needed to be dead before nightfall. Dinza's brother's hearing was the following day. The hit would send a message to everyone who considered testifying. Dodson said that he and his driver, Walter Jazz Samuel, met Dinza at one of his gas stations. Dinza provided them with a white van. They watched Satinderjit's house until he came out. He was with his cousin. a disturbance so that Satinderjit would pull over and allow the van to pass. When he did, the van blocked him from moving. Dodson shot the unarmed man eight times at close range. The hitman's description of the events of that day corroborated a neighbor's statement to police. Dotson also told investigators that after the killing, he had returned the white van to Dinza's garage on Roosevelt Avenue. He gave the gun back to Dinza, who paid him and the driver $20,000 for the hit. On July 6, 1997, police approached the Brooklyn home of Walter Jazz Samuels, the man who Dotson claimed had driven the van. They arrested him without incident. Police learned that Samuels had a record of previous arrests. With Samuels in custody, investigators turned their attention to Dinza. The U.S. Attorney's Office believed agents and detectives now had enough evidence to indict Dinza on federal racketeering charges. Special agent in charge Kevin Donovan and, recalls uh, that agents dispersed across the city to find him. FBI agents and New York City Police Department detectives initiated surveillances at several city gas corporation gas stations in which Dinza Singh was known to frequent. At 5 p.m. on July 7, 1997, FBI agents and NYPD detectives followed Dinza to his Foster Avenue gas station. When he arrived, they arrested him for murder, kidnapping, pump fraud, and obstruction of justice in aid of a corrupt organization. The entire case hinged on the testimony of Dinza's hitman, Marvin Dodson. But because Dodson was a murderer, the U.S. attorney still needed to substantiate his story with other evidence or witness testimony. They hoped that testimony would come from Walter Jazz Samuels, the man who Dodson fingered as his accomplice in the murder of Satinderjit Singh. 
Samuels now told investigators he was not in the van at the time of the shooting. He claimed he was at a nearby restaurant. His story checked out. Investigators believe Samuels knew who drove Dodson on the day of the killing. But he wasn't talking, and neither was Dodson. Investigators needed something else to corroborate Dodson's story. They secured a search warrant for Dinza's Roosevelt Avenue gas station, the place where Dodson had returned the white van after the murder. They searched the entire premises, here. but found little other than stolen license plates. They believe they were probably used on getaway cars during the commission of crimes. But once bags. again, they had no proof. They found nothing that could corroborate Dodson's story or connect Dinza to the murder. As the FBI and police continued to pursue evidence, Dinza was behind bars once again pending a July 14th bail hearing. Investigators hoped Dinza's incarceration would encourage witnesses to come forward. It did not. As before, Dinza continued to rule with an iron hand. Unfortunately, as a result of Dinza Singh's ability to make telephone calls from jail, he was able to continue to run his corporation and his business and to focus on threatening additional individuals who might have come forward to cooperate with the FBI and the New York City Police Department. For the second time in three months, authorities held the suspected murderer behind bars. They hoped it would be his final arrest. But the millionaire hired a high-priced defense team, and the prosecution's entire case still hinged on the testimony of a confessed killer. In July of 1997, a man named Dint had been arrested on federal racketeering charges that included murder and kidnapping to protect his corrupt business empire. It was his second arrest in three months. As he had before, Dinza directed his business and even threatened potential witnesses from a prison telephone. But this time, investigators were listening. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell was not going to let Dinza slip through his hands again. They had to keep him behind bars. First, um, his conversation was in Punjabi, which is a very um, unique dialect and uh, it took us some time before we could find a Punjabi translator to translate those telephone calls. Secondly, he was not um, very overt in his conversation, so he was somewhat cryptic in his um, conversation with his colleagues. The translations opened a rare view into just how tightly Dinza held the reins to his empire. Dinza attracted customers to his rigged pumps by advertising the lowest gas prices in New York. But his pumps provided less than a gallon for the price. He was issuing routine instructions to the members of his office, telling them to um, change the price of gasoline at his various stations, to continue to order supplies for his company. In addition, um, he also gave them instructions about um, things to communicate to their attorneys and steps to be taken in order to try and get him out on bail. As Campbell raced to find evidence to keep Dinza from making bail, police processed the suspect's car. They found business cards that linked Dinza to his hitman, Marvin Dodson, and Dodson's operative, Walter Jazz Samuels. Police also recovered a list of names and addresses that appeared to be a hit list. The list included the home address of Savjit Singh, a federal witness who had fled the city with his family. Balwant Singh, who was under protective custody, had also made the list. Seven more men with Punjabi names appeared as well. It was just what investigators needed to keep Dinza from making bail. While they did not know whether these men were dead or alive, they knew who might. Agents asked Walter Samuels about the list, hoping it would prompt his memory. He finally opened up. He said that Dinza had planned to kill those nine men. 
Two of them, Balwant and Sarvjit, were federal witnesses. The other seven were Balwant's family members. They were all still alive. Once again, agents would need to corroborate the story. Confined in the room next door, Marvin Dodson and his lawyer waited to be questioned. Dodson confirmed Samuel's story and added something else. He said that on July 3rd, just days before Dinza's most recent arrest, Dinza had purchased two used police cruisers as part of the assassination plan. Dodson had copies of the titles, which his lawyer now offered to the agent as proof. Mr. Dinza's plan was for Mr. Dodson and Mr. Samuels to pose as law enforcement officers and to stop Mr. to stop Balwant Singh um, on the street along with members of his family and uh, kidnap them and bring them to Mr. Dinza at an undisclosed location. You're going to try to cram all these people Feeling the pressure and hoping to cut a deal, Samuels now told investigators the name of the man who drove the white van during the murder. His name was Evans Alonzo Powell. Because Powell had no arrest record, Dodson wanted to protect him. He had threatened Samuels not to give him up. On July 19, 1997, police arrested Powell on a Brooklyn street. He agreed to cooperate. Powell admitted that he had driven the van for the murder in Queens. Investigators finally had their corroborating witness. Powell also talked about another crime. Tell us more about where Dinza had ordered the murder of the Indian man who had traveled to America to search for his missing brother. Powell was present when Dodson killed the attendant at the Brooklyn gas station on the night of March 16, 1997. Detective Tony Brazada remembers Dodson's confession. He admitted uh, shooting him twice in the head, had him, kneel, had him kneeling down. And he said he got, he got paid by Singh for doing this. He, that Singh wanted this person uh, killed. He didn't give him a reason, but he just wanted him killed. Dinza had paid Dodson just $4,000 for taking the man's life. Dodson stole money to pay Powell for being the lookout. Special agent in charge, Kevin Donovan, continued to gather evidence about Dinza's pump rigging activities. The FBI and the New York City Police Department executed a search warrant at the Foster Avenue City Gas gas station. The focus of our search was to identify and obtain evidence of the pump rigging scheme. As a result of a, the excavation of the area around the pump, electronic devices were located in a box that was used to control the pump rigging scheme. Investigators determined that Dinza manipulated the flow of gasoline to customers' cars through devices controlled by remote, wired to the pumps and buried underground. The systems could be turned on or off at will. Detective Teddy Braun explains that Dinza taught many of his employees when to turn them on and off. You were taught how to work on remote. And what would happen would be if a person, look, for instance, if a person came in for a gallon of gas for their lawnmower, what would happen was the gas attendant would hit a, a remote in his pocket, which was just like a car alarm remote. And what that would do, it would shut off the skimming system. And the system would go right up to perfect so that when the gas attendant pumped a, a gallon worth of gas in a, in a container, it was perfect. So there would be no question. In late July of 1997, the FBI conducted an exhaustive search of Dinza's Brooklyn Warehouse headquarters. There they found his double books. We discovered documents reflecting bribery payments to a corrupt Department of Consumer Affairs inspector. In addition, we also estimate um, the total value of Mr. Dinza's um, pump fraud activities in the neighborhood of $40 million over 10 years. By September of 1998, the body of the man abducted from a gas station in the Bronx in 1995 was still missing. 
but agents had a hunch. Based on New York City construction records at the time of his disappearance, agents suspected that Dinza had buried the attendant underneath one of his gas stations. It was determined that the most likely gas station that was under construction at that time was a gas station located at Farragut and Flatbush Avenue. On September 16, 1998, investigators arrived at the station with heavy equipment. They employed ground-penetrating radar to help locate the body beneath the earth. They selected two separate sites where they believed the man might be buried. The construction crew removed slabs of concrete, and the FBI, the New York City Police Department, examined these two sites that were located by the ground-penetrating radar. Investigators never found the man's body. Though this news was disappointing, investigators were having better luck with other leads. Assistant U.S. Attorney Ben Campbell subpoenaed Dinza's cell phone records. They placed Dinza at the time and place of Satinderjit Singh's murder. Prosecutors were well armed when Dinza's trial began in Brooklyn Federal District Court. Court. They hoped to convict him on 29 counts, Guilty. including capital murder. murder. Savjit Singh, who assisted the investigation despite death threats, testified against the man accused of killing his friends. On March 2, 1999, after two and a half days of deliberations, the jury found Dinza guilty of 21 of the 29 counts. They included murder, attempted murder, and fraud. Dinza was acquitted in the kidnapping of the man whose body was never found. On October 5, 1999, Dinza received eight life sentences without possibility of parole. He escaped the death penalty. Later that month, the same judge sentenced Dinza's hitmen for their roles in the murders. For assisting in the conviction of Dinza, their sentences were considerably lighter. Powell received 10 years, Samuels 12, and Dodson 18. But it was the conviction of Dinza that was most satisfying to prosecutors. Prosecution of Mr. Dinza was a very, sort of personally for me, a very rewarding experience. We were able to step into a community that frequently does not turn to law enforcement for assistance and to render some significant help to them in order to remove an individual who was, um, I mean, for lack of a better term, um, a plague on that community. Like many immigrants before him, Dinza arrived a poor man and was embraced by a community of compatriots. But he repaid their kindness with swindles and murder. For his greed and brutality, he will never be free again.